Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Uncorked Corner podcast. Today, we welcome Caesar from Prohibito Wines. We are so excited to have him on. If you could get us started by introducing yourself and telling us a bit about your background. Hi, uh, yeah. Thank you guys for having me. Uh, my name is Caesar, like you said. Um, my background will, uh, it's a little bit of a mix of a lot of things. Um, I grew up in El Salvador. Um, I have a background in biology and chemistry. To be honest, uh, the only reason why I chose biology and chemistry was because I I like field trips to the forest, you know, nothing else, nothing fancy, nothing exciting about, you know, the chemistry side of it. But um, when I moved into uh, California, actually I came to LA and um, it was like a, the city was too big for me, you know? So I was like looking for something small and more like agriculture, more like country, type of, you know, life. And uh, I moved to Sonoma. I spent like almost a year probably in LA and then I moved to Sonoma County. And then I fell in love with a winery um, that I went to visit for the first time. And actually they ended up hiring me right away on the spot, you know, and uh, I was part of the, a big project actually back in the days. Uh, this project was called um, Vinovation. And the reason why it was uh, because um, it was a new technology developing at that time, and it was uh, the implementation of uh, machines like uh, reverse osmosis machine into the wine industry. So before, uh, there was no way to remove volatile acid from the wine. So, you know, I mean, you know, wine has a lot of different bacteria, and it has a lot of different levels of, uh, of bacteria that you are allowed to have in, the, in wine, you know? And some of them are not desirable. And some of them, you know, you can even bottle the wine, you know, if it has too much bacteria. So I was part of that uh, project uh, back in 1999. And uh, I was working with them for a long time. And that allowed me also to see a big, a big, uh, uh, a different ways, let's put it that way, a different ways of winemaking in California, Right now, I think in, in the whole of the States, there is a uh, wine production, you know, so I was traveling pretty much everywhere and uh, also in Canada. And now I'm here in Mexico doing the, pretty much the same thing, you know, helping out, uh, trying to, you know, uh, give advices and give a little bit of help with the wines that are producing here in Mexico as well, that is kind of like uh, growing, you know. So I will say that's pretty much, you know, my background. Now, when you, you said you were hired by a winery, was that your first job working there? That You jumped right in with that, or did you start doing something else and then move into that? No, actually, that was my, my first job. I mean, you know, right away. I mean, when I saw a winery and I saw the lab and I saw, you know, the tanks and everything, I fell in love. And uh, I was lucky that, you know, I was talking to the owner of that winery and they were, uh, they were developing that, you know, company that I was telling you about, Vinovation. And then uh, uh, I started working with them and then I went to school to study uh, viticulture management. I graduated from San Rosa uh, JC College, a uh, junior college. And uh, I was one of the first uh, promotions of the viticulture certificate that they were offering before. It was kind of a shame, like living in the wine country in Sonoma County. And, you know, people have to go to Davis and people have to go to uh, Fresno State to get some agriculture, you know, viticulture, agriculture uh, classes and diplomas and stuff like that, you know, and uh, we didn't have anything. So I was uh, one of the first uh, people that graduated as a viticulture management. And uh, after that, you know, the enology part, I was living it, I was working on it. So my whole life I have been like, making wine pretty much for different people. I have worked at different harvests for small scale wineries. I have worked uh, harvest season for big scale wineries as well. So I kind of got to see a little bit everything and different winemaking styles, different philosophies. And, you know, now in 2016, I started up my own label, you know, I mean, everybody was were asking me why you're not doing your own, you know, so I decided to do it, so, you know. And you travel around quite a bit. Where are you right now? I'm in Valle de Guadalupe right now. And what's there? 
where is here? Well, there is a lot of wineries actually. Uh, Valle de Guadalupe is in uh, Baja California, close to Ensenada. Um, and uh, well, believe it or not, mm -hmm. uh, Mexico has the biggest, well, not the biggest, but uh, the oldest uh, winery in the whole continent. Casa Madero, I think, has been producing wine since, I don't know, since the missionaries came over and brought the grapes, you know, and started up over here. I think in Loreto, down south in uh, uh, in Baja California, the south or the, the sur, uh, they are the ones that, you know, that's where I think the missions, the missionaries came in and uh, started up planting the vines. So Casa Madero, uh, I think, is uh, one of the oldest uh wineries in the whole continent i think it has more than 500 years and i'm just coming from another meeting another big winery over here santo tomas has 192 years as well so um uh, i think they they're trying to you know mexico is not a big a big wine producer i mean i think it's well known for the beer and the tequila and all that sort of stuff but i think they're trying they're trying and you know uh I'm here and I'm kind of like helping out a little bit. Uh, I came like in 2010 to do a few jobs. I didn't stay. The reason why was because, uh, believe it or not, uh, it's kind of hard to believe even for me at this point, uh, that there is no regulations in Mexico, you know? There's no quality regulations. So sometimes I feel like, you know, my services are not needed because I'm looking for quality, you know, instead of quantity. And I wanna make the best wine that I can, you know? And if I see an opportunity, I jump on it. But if it, people don't care, and if they don't really, you know, are interested on it, you know, it's like kind of like disappointing to me, you know? So, because there was no, because there's no regulation, there's no requirement for the things that I do, you know? But um, in 2018, I got a call from a few uh, big uh, producers down here. And I came over and I came over and since I worked with them for like two months, uh, I never stopped working here, you know? Now I have a few people that are helping me out. I'm telling them what to do. And we are like pretty much traveling a little bit of Mexico. We have been in Chihuahua as well, uh, making wine better. And, uh, you know, we're just helping a little bit, you know? Now I know you mentioned kind of trying to develop sort of a wine culture down there in Mexico. Uh, is there any particular styles of wine or any particular grapes or anything that do particularly well down there that they, it's kind of unique to that region? Or is it kind of just, uh, you know, the local flavor on common styles around the world? Well, this actually, um, I think because um, there, there were some wine producers uh, in the beginning that had some kind of like Italian background. Uh, like, for example, uh, Camilo Magoni is one of the pioneers. Um, those people brought in a lot of Italian varieties. There is a lot of uh, Neviolos. There is also a Spanish infusion. There's a lot of, of Tempranillos around. There, there's some uh, varieties. There's, they're not from here, but they call it that they're from here because the missionaries brought it. Um, actually, one of them is called Mission Grape, actually. And uh, it's kind of funny that I found the same grape in, in, in the South Hemisphere of uh, America, in Peru. They call it Flower of Peru, Rosa del Peru. And uh, I was telling them over here that it's the same variety. And, and actually, they are not agree with me, but I know it is. You know, I started with cultures for a reason. And uh, they're kind of proud of what they're growing and they want to try to make it their own like the Neviolo, they're so proud of the Neviolos even though you know uh, there is a variety that is kind of interesting and um, actually I'm going to launch a label pretty soon that is going to be um, the variety is um, Lambrusca di Alessandria it's from Italia from Italy uh, it's uh, from Piedmont area as well and uh, they have they have that variety as a neviolo, you know, you know, but they call it the Mexican neviolo. And I'm like, but there's no such a thing, you know, there's no Mexican neviolo, you know, it can be, you know. So uh, 
but they're like, well, you know, this is like one of those situations, like when you fell in love with a little kid, you know, and you raise him up and whatever, and then, you know, you find out it's not yours, you know, but you're in love, you know? So I'm like, okay, I get it, but you know, kind of what it is. <laughs> yeah, kind of what it is, you know? So uh, I'm kind of like, uh, like, I don't know if we, I'm going to make the mistake and if a lot of people are going to like it or not, but I'm going to name it Lambrusca de Alessandria, actually, you know, the way it is. Nice. And most of your wines, so Prohibido is in California. So yeah. where are your wines being sourced from? I know you have some from Sonoma and some from Napa. Are you growing on your own vineyards or are you kind of sourcing those from all different vineyards from around uh, the region? No, actually, I have a, a few people uh, that I know. I knew uh, some friends that they, you know, they grow grapes. And uh, to be honest, uh, I just try to, I don't have my own vineyard. I just look for the opportunity to make something better where I see the opportunity. And uh, since I know a lot of people, I try to pick and I try to see where I can get the best grapes, you know? And uh, yeah, like you're, you're right, my, my uh, Pinot Noir is uh, from Sonoma Coast. Uh, my Cabernet Sauvignon is from uh, Napa Valley. And uh, in November, I borrowed my uh, Cabernet Sauvignon from California, which is sold out pretty much. We had a big sale last Friday. I still have a few cases you know, left, but uh, we sold like 100 cases last Friday. You know, and I just in 24 hour sale that we did. But um, I'm pretty small uh, pro wine producer, you know. I cannot be taking care of too much wine. I'm pretty busy most of the time. So I never make more than 150 cases, you know. So that probably makes me a, a, like a boutique uh, winery. And we make all our grapes, I and mean, we crush all our grapes, and we make uh, our wine in Sebastopol, California. And uh, there's a winery right there that is called a Meadowcroft Winery. And uh, it's kind of like a custom crush facility, you know? So it's kind of a nice and neat because um, we kind of share, you know, uh, tips, you know, and, you know, it's good whenever, uh, when anybody's gonna borrow uh, some wine, it's good to have a second opinion, you know? Hey, what do you think about this? You know, you think it's ready? What can I do or, you know? Sometimes people pick something else that you know you're not picking up in the nose or in the taste, you know. So it's I think it's a it's it's a great opportunity and a good way to make wine, you know, in a community that is you know making different uh, wine styles, you know. Yep, and I also think that when you have a label like that and you you're not necessarily tied to your own vineyard, it gives you the opportunities for some freedom. You can you know go source grapes from different areas that you think if there's a particular style of wine that you wanted to make or if you think you know, this area right here is the perfect conditions that these are going to be the best grapes. You can kind of pick and choose and say, all right, this is what we're going to do. This is the wine right here. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. I think, uh, well, I think you guys are also going to be agree with me that, um, to be honest, uh, the wine is made at the vineyard, you know? I mean, if you don't have good grapes, most likely you're not going to have a good wine, you know? So you got to pay attention more at the vineyard and the way uh, the vines are growing, how are developing and the vigor and the training of the vines and, you know, how the weather is acting out as well, you know? And uh, yeah, actually that's an advantage, like you were saying, you know, I had the flexibility to, to see and to pick whatever I think, you know, is the best, you know? Um, Cause like I said, I mean, I don't take any, any credit for the one that I'm making, actually, I. I give the credit to the people that work in the vineyard, you know, because I think uh, that's where actually everything happens. And you're a, a boutique winery, so I imagine that you have a lot of opportunity to test out new varietals, maybe even more so than some of the bigger ones do, because you can really play around with smaller batches. Is there anything that you have coming out soon or that you have planned for the future, or things that you'd like to add to your lineup? You know, um, there's a lot of stuff that I would like to try, to be honest, but um, I have learned through years and uh, that when you're passionate about it, you know, you got to find people that are passionate about it as well, you know, and sometimes uh, it's kind of hard to find people that are passionate about it and that become uh, customers as well from your product, you know. 
So um, there's a lot of varieties that would like to try, that would like to do. I think uh, they will do really good. But um, I think people, you know, are looking for specific varieties nowadays, you know, and those are the well-known, the Cabernet Sauvignons, you know, the Pinot Noirs, the Merlots, and, you know, and stuff like that. So I wish that I could have the luxury to play around and, you know, have, you know, more stuff and, you know, that I would like to do. But, you know, everything costs money, you know, and I know a lot of people that have followed their passions and they're broke now, <laughs> you know. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, they're happy probably, but they're broken, you know, they they have their wine philosophy and they have make a lot of different varieties. I think they do really great, great wines for me, but a lot of people don't understand, you know, uh, those factors, you know. So I know what you're saying and I wish, you know, I could and, you know, but I think maybe, I don't know. Later on, probably there's going to be more people that are going to be jumping into the different wine style, different varieties. And, you know, I think uh, uh, everything is going to be growing more and going beyond them, the regular uh, wine varieties that we have, you know. That brings up sort of an interesting topic because it really, you know, it's tough. Everyone has their set styles. You know, someone might always, I like Cabernet Sauvignon. I like Pinot Noirs. They might be stuck in these four or five, you know, reds mm -hmm. that are common. Um what opportunities do you think are out there for, I guess, that education to expand to like the general consumer? Like how can some of these more interesting, uh, unique, maybe more rare styles or less produced styles be communicated to people say, oh, well, this is, you know, you have to try this, you might like it. And just basically the lack of availability is the reason why people probably don't know about it. How do you think that can improve? Improve if if the media are playing a bigger role helping out, because to be honest, and I don't know if you guys uh, had that experience, uh, to me, like people that know me and people that think that are gonna make me happy with a bottle of wine when I go to big cities like New York, LA, Chicago, they, they are so grateful and they wanna give me a bottle of wine and they come up to me with a Stella Rosa, you know? And to me, it's like, to me, that's not wine, you know? First of all, there's no vintage on it. Uh, there's no variety in most of them, you know? It's a product of Italy, but, you know, that can be anything, you know? And uh, it has some sort of sugar, you know? And uh, I, I call it like the Starbucks of coffee, you know? There's more way better coffee than Starbucks, you know? But a lot of people go to Starbucks because, you know, they get whatever they want with a, a lot of sugar and all that kind of stuff. So I think if the media start like promoting more stuff, like, you know, different varieties, not really rare varieties, but because, you know, there is, I think there are normal varieties, but people don't know them that well, maybe like a Barbera from Italy, you know? And uh, if they start uh, focusing in different and, and extra varieties from some other places, Mabasia Bianca is one of my favorite ones, you know, that I love. And uh, I think that will help improve all of this because like I said, I mean, I think people buy Estrella Rosa, one, because it's cheap. Second, because, you know, they see in big billboards, you know, uh, right next to the freeway, you know, and Celebration, Estrella Rosa and whatever. So, and then they see uh, in, in any liquor store or any, you know, uh, grocery store, and there is, you know, something cheap, something, you know, is, that is there available and with the residual sugar. So I think if the media start helping out more with the, uh, with the different varieties, well, the, with the big variety that there is, you know, I think uh, people are gonna probably start trying different varieties, you know, and open the world of the wine making and the wine tasting as well for themselves and for the whole, for the whole industry, because I have seen the uh, through the years the you know varieties trending are changing all the time, all the time, and people are tearing down vines and planting whatever is trending. You know what people are buying. You know, and uh, I don't think that's fair. You know, I mean, I know that everybody you know are trying to sell wine, trying to you know uh, give the customer what people are looking for, but at the same time, uh, I think uh, you know we gotta understand 
um, what we're drinking. We gotta understand the wine itself, you know. Um, I don't know if you remember back in the days, like in 2000, before Rosé was very popular, I think it started out with the white Zinfandel, you know. And uh, now you you don't find white white uh, white Zinfandel, you know, it's Rosé. And you find Rosé in any kind of variety, you know. So um, I think the media and the marketing and all those factors, I think, uh, uh, can help a lot, you know, to launch all of these other uh, varieties that are, are not well known. So for you, when you're, when you're making your wines, how long does that process take for them to go into the barrel and be done? And is there, are there key factors that you look for that you know this, this is final, this is what I wanted? Oh yeah, from the beginning, I think uh, uh, since we pick the grapes, you know, we pick with different uh, parameters, you know, thinking uh, what is the alcohol level uh, we want to achieve in the end, thinking about the aromas as well, thinking about the pH, thinking about the TA, the total acidity in the wine. So from that point, we start, you know, making the wine and uh, we start getting our, our own profile in our brain and, you know, in our thoughts and ideas and thinking how that wine is going to develop. And then after the fermentation is done, well, actually, you know, right after when the fermentation is going on, you start doing punch downs or, you know, pump overs and you are trying to see how much color are you going to extract, you know, from the skins and all that kind of stuff. So, um, after that, you start thinking, well, this one is pretty good. Or oh, maybe, you know, we might need a little bit of a structure from the wood. And uh, I try to use a uh, neutral wood, you know, or barrels that have been used before. Right now, if you can see, I mean, I'm over here in, in my house slash, you know, office and little <laughs> cellar as well. Uh, and I have some French oak um, that I like to use a lot. Uh, I buy the barrels to use, people that I know as well, and they're healthy barrels. And, you know, I don't like to give uh, the taste of the wood to the wine, to be honest. I think it's an artificial flavor, you know. I mean, wine shouldn't taste like wood, you know. Anybody can make wine like that, I believe, if you buy a brand new barrel, right? I mean, if you can put some bad wine, it's going to taste like wood. But uh, that's that's my idea. That's my mentality. That's that's how I am making the wine. That's what I'm picturing how the wine is gonna end up. You know, I don't like to steal the aromas. You know, the stairs. You know, that come from the wine. You know, because like I say, you know, it's a lot of work in the vineyard, and I want all that work to be reflected. You know, sometimes I'm not happy with my pinot noirs because I think uh, it's missing the uh, characteristic of the typical uh, pinot noir. You know. But uh, at the same time, you gotta understand that you know the terroir is also playing a big a big factor. You know, in this area, it's not gonna be an Italian Pinot Noir. It's not gonna be an Oregonian Pinot Noir. You know, because we're growing in in in, in Sonoma Coast area. You know, that has a different type of soil, has a different type of uh, microclimate, and you know, it's gonna be different. Plus, uh, the wine making style probably is gonna be a little bit different as well. Because, like I say, uh, in Oregon has more; they have more rain over there, and uh, probably they are not gonna get that much skin contact. And um, I like a little bit more color on my pinots, you know. And uh, yeah, I think uh, you know from the beginning, from from the grapes are starting to uh, get ripe is when we start thinking about how the wine profile is gonna be in the end. And that's uh, really interesting that you bring up the barrels. I was going to lead into that next. As a whiskey guy, that's kind of my drink of choice when I'm drinking liquor. Uh, the barrel has so much to do with it and all the regulations. You know, bourbon, for example, needs to be aged in new charred oak barrels for a certain amount of time. Um, scotch, everything. They all do different things, the barrels, to impart certain flavors. So in trying to only keep the flavors of the grapes like really forward and not use that what do you turn to like you said i know you go for like french oak but um and you get used barrels do you look at what was actually in the barrel beforehand uh like are you going staying away from something that's gonna be really strong they'll impart a certain flavor on it like a previous 
liquor or something, a barrel maybe that's been used two or three times that more of that wood's been washed out of it? Yeah, exactly. I try to look for uh, neutral barrels, to be honest. Um, I, uh, my barrels that I got actually are barrels that have been used for Cabernet Sauvignons. I'm going to use them for Cabernet Sauvignons as well. Um, they got to be clean inside, you know, very clean. The purpose of the, of the aging the wine into the barrel is so the, the micro particles of the oxygen travel to the wood cells, you know, and start aging the wine little by little, you know, that's the only uh, purpose of the barrel, you know. Of course, you know, there is a lot of stuff nowadays that, you know, if you have medium toes, heavy toes, uh, toes the heads and stuff like that, you know, and the barrels that, you know, are going to provide some structure and some flavors as well. But um, again, I mean, I think uh, I like to respect the variety. I like to respect, you know, the, the aromas that the grapes are providing. And um, I don't, I don't want to have a, a wine that is woody, you know, to be honest, you know. So uh, that's what I'm looking for on the on the barrels, to be honest. I know that even now, like you mentioned it, uh, there's people that are making wine, uh, storing wine into whiskey uh, barrels, you know, that have been used for whiskey, you know. And uh, they, you know, they get the, the caramel, you know, kind of character, you know, from the, from the whiskey. I don't know if we, you know, there's market for it, probably there is, you know. I don't saying that it's nothing bad, but you know, but, but I don't, personally, you know, if you want to drink whiskey, I drink whiskey, you know, I'm not going to drink wine that tastes like whiskey, you know. Yep, I hear you. <laughs> and for our listeners who haven't gotten to try our wines yet, we have the, the two Cabernets and the Pinot. I know Nick opened the Pinot. I opened the one of the Cabernets, the, the newer one, the 2018. And both are both are great. We both are very much enjoying the flavors. They're very prominent on their own. I think they have really nice flavor notes. Um, what are the key flavors in each of the two wines that we've opened? So Nick has the Pinot Noir and I have the Cabernet Sauvignon 2018 that that a listener would experience when they're tasting the wine from home. And I'll start off before you go into it by saying, like I said, I'm a whiskey and beer guy. I don't have a very sophisticated wine palate. The way that I judge it is, is it good or do I not like it? And this one, my glass is gone. So it was definitely good because we haven't been on the call that long. So I'll give you credit for that one. Okay, good. Man. Thanks. Um, well, you know, each variety, like I say, has a, like a, some characteristic. Um, I think uh, I try to make wines the are enjoyable at any moment at any time i'm not thinking that you know i'm gonna make this particular cabernet sauvignon with a lot of tannins a lot of structure so people can eat it with the you know a new year steak at dinner you know i'm not thinking about those things i like it when people can open a bottle of wine at any time and enjoy it at any time if it is with dinner okay go ahead you know but i'm not actually thinking for to make a Cabernet Sauvignon with a lot of tannins because a lot of people don't like it, you know? If you're a beginner and you open a, a bottle of wine for, from let's say one through vine or, you know, places that make really vigorous wines, you might not like it even if it's a $500 bottles of wine, you know? So I like to like uh, make the wines kind of mellow, you know, kind of, uh have some aromas that will attract the people to drink it you know and to taste it and um uh, i think uh you know those are my my ideas and those are my philosophies when i'm trying to uh make the wine and finish the wine as well it's provided with the with the bottle of wine that you can taste for example on this particular wine the Cabernet Sauvignon i think uh, you get a lot of ripe plums you get a lot of uh, a lot of blackberry as well. I think you get a little bit of brown sugar. I don't know if you guys tasted that. And um, the Pinot Noir, I think, is a very aromatic uh, wine. Uh, it kind of appeals to you to drink it, and I think uh, it has a lot of characteristic of of like a Pinot Noir, good acidity. It's a wine that you can drink at any time as well. So I think. Uh, uh, 
all of those wines are enjoyable at any time, like I said. And uh, I think that's pretty much, it's like a any time, any drinker or, you know, any any occasion one, you know. Uh, we used to uh, mess around back in the days when Prohibido started up, like, oh, you know, what's going to be your slogan, you know? How is it going to be? And I was like, well, I think the best thing about, you know, people enjoying wine and all that is like, I don't want I don't want people to drink or to take a bottle of wine for a special occasion. You know, I want people to get a, get the wine and make any a moment special. You know, any occasion special. You know, so I think uh, we have achieved that, and people can drink this wine at any time. You know, in any season with whoever, and I think uh, you guys are gonna have a great time with Prohibido wines. And we definitely had a great time talking to you tonight, for sure. So can you let our listeners know where they can find your wines, uh, whether it's to buy the actual wines themselves and get their hands on them to give them a try, and then also find you online and social media so they can check out all the other content you guys have? Totally, absolutely. Uh, my wines are being sold pretty much online uh, right now. Most of them, they, they have been selling in restaurants, to be honest. One through one house baker is one of my uh, bigger supporters. My one of my biggest people that you know they are really making really great pastries and bakery and spaghetti and stuff like that. They are really great people that are in Venetia and um, you know different also different restaurants that are co-owned with the employees are the ones that are selling you know my wines at the restaurant. But um, since the pandemic, you know, and all that kind of stuff. You know, they are shut down right now. So pretty much we're selling the wine online. So if you, they want to try your wine, they can go to prohibitedwines.com and uh, they can buy right there at the store. And uh, they can follow us on on social media as well, at Prohibido Wines. And we're on Instagram, we're on, on Facebook as well. And uh, Prohibido is, you know, it's a Spanish word that, you know, I came for came from prohibition, you know? Um, it's kind of funny that back in the days, right? In 1920 to, until 1932, I think it was prohibition, you know, when alcohol was forbidden in the United States. So if you tell anybody that story, people are gonna be like, no, I can't believe it, you know? How could it be, you know? But it was, you know? So that's why I named it Pro Prohibido. And, you know, I don't mind if you call it Prohibido. If it's that easy for you to find it, so go to prohibitedwines.com, you know? But if, it, if it's not, go to prohibitedwines.com. So that's where you can find our wine, at prohibitedwines.com for now until all of this mess of the coronavirus stops and, you know, people start going back to the restaurants and start enjoying it, you know, in, in the restaurants, you know? Um, pretty much uh, we're selling to local, um, local restaurants, you know? So, but you know, the, this is a huge country. So wherever you guys are, we can ship it, you know, and uh, we have really good deals going on in our website, you know, so go ahead, visit prohibitedwines.com and you'll find out all the different type of wines that we have. Great, and we have very much enjoyed the wines ourselves and we will be sharing and tagging you on social media. But for everybody who's listening, we will include the link to shop in, on the website on uh, the show notes. So we'll get that on there so you can just easily click and visit the website. Perfect. Yes, but thank you so much. We really appreciated having you on. No, Cheers. thank you guys. It was amazing. It was nice to be talking about wine like always, you know? We love it Absolutely. too. <laughs> so glad. We'll have you on again another time. We can chat some more. Thank you. Perfect. Have a good night. Cheers. Thank you too. Good night. Bye-bye. Cheers. Be sure to follow us on social at Uncorked Corner and on the blog at uncorkedcorner.com for a taste of more food and beverage content. And if you enjoyed the show, don't forget to leave a comment, subscribe, rate, and review on whatever podcast platform you prefer. Thanks for listening.